Hi everybody, this is Austin at the Best I Can Afford Antiques channel. Um, <coughs> before we go too far, I'd like to remind you that uh, if you'd like, you could subscribe to my channel and uh, it'll tell you when I upload a new video. We're going to talk about something pretty interesting today, but I like to think that many of my videos have displayed and educated people about many beautiful and neat objects. So if you'd like to subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything and you might end up learning something. So today we're going to talk about Chinese and Japanese cloisonne. This is a uh, somewhat unfair comparison because I do not have as nice of Chinese cloisonne as I do Japanese cloisonne. Now these are nice pieces, it's just that um, you know I don't own anything from like the Ming Dynasty or you know I don't think even the 1800s as far as Chinese cloisonne goes. But I do own some pretty fair representations of Chinese cloisonne, so I think we can successfully have this conversation and uh, we can learn a thing or two. <clears throat> There's still things common to uh, Chinese cloisonne that were common to Chinese cloisonne a long time ago. Um, let's discuss differences, um, general differences first, okay? so. Right here we've got sitting some uh, some little pieces and we'll talk briefly about little um, borders and fences and stuff like that. Oh my goodness. I knew that little swan or goose was going to fall over. I knew I shouldn't have put him in front of anybody because they don't exactly stand uh, firmly on their own. Okay. So um, let's talk about this specific border first, because this is common to Chinese cloisonne um, since the beginning of Chinese cloisonne almost. Uh, I could be slightly wrong about that, but I think that's been a very common border on Chinese cloisonne for a long time. I think it's called a ru yi. Um, it's something like that. I forget the uh, Asian word for it, but a lot of people just call it the mushroom border so when you're looking at Chinese cloisonne typically you'll find a mushroom border or sometimes at least um, these are usually feathers and they're fairly common for uh, Chinese cloisonne as well and again you'll see the mushroom border repeated right here and this is kind of in the vein of older Chinese cloisonne uh, Chinese cloisonne will typically have at least something in the background. It may not be um, background cloisons as much as it may be designs. Um, and this is, you know, this is a clever way to hold the cloi or hold the enamel in place. We should talk about enamel just a little bit, especially if you're just learning about this stuff. <clears throat> Enamel is crushed glass and minerals in a liquid or paste form. So what they would do is they would start with this metal vase right here, okay? This entire thing. And uh, they would draw the pictures in wire. You can see the wires. You can see them shine. And they would uh, paste or solder these to the outside of the surface and then they would fill it in with the uh, paste or liquid enamel and once they've got this filled in to the color they want it to be they'll fire it and that hardens it and then they sand it um, so yeah I mean there's a there's quite a few processes and then if you want like slightly different colors like this sometimes you would have to add a color um, bake it sand it come back to it and you know add more of whatever color or shade you wanted so on and so forth so yeah um you know a lot a lot a lot a lot of chinese cloisonne has background cloisons which are these little cloud shapes right here and um i've asked my friend chris pressing to uh post his blog um link in the comments and uh hopefully he'll do that <clears throat> Because he's a wealth of information about, uh, you know, different cloud patterns and different cloison patterns and all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, I don't claim to know everything, and there's a lot of people who know a lot more than me. So, so really, just use any resource you can, and uh, you'll just be better off. 
So yeah, these are background cloisons, um, some kind, sometimes called diapers, actually, which is kind of weird, but but it's to stop the liquid from running down. So I mean, I guess uh, I guess that'll apply. So yeah, then we come back to this one, and this is actually a little more keeping in style with um, like older cloisonné from China, because you kind of have instead of the background cloisons, you've kind of got like a sweeping design that would serve the same purpose as uh, background cloisons would. I realize now, I don't think I have any water in this room. And since I'm talking like, you know, just expelling a ton of air, my mouth tends to get pretty dry. <clears throat> so you do find, um, you do find background cloisons in some pieces. Uh, you'll find it in early Japanese pieces um, which are basically just imitations of Chinese cloisonné. Like, uh, the first, the first, uh, Japanese cloisonné started because a Chinese, or I mean a Japanese, um, did I say the first Japanese cloisonné? Okay, the first Japanese cloisonné started because a samurai, who wasn't getting paid enough, took apart a piece of Japanese cloisonné, or I mean Chinese cloisonné, oh my word, and, uh, learned how to make it. Now, now, usually in Japanese cloisonné, if you do see background cloisons on a uh, somewhat less antique piece, there'll be these swirly gigs like this instead of uh, cloud shapes or anything like that. Now, the Japanese did use cloud shapes, but it wasn't as common, and uh, it was only until they kind of found their own footing in Japanese cloisonné. So once they once they started, you know, doing things on their own as opposed to imitating Chinese cloisonné, that's when they really started uh, branching out and making different kinds of pictures and stuff. So, so um, I think that that little green one right there, you know, it's a shame because I don't have any, you know, antique pieces of Chinese cloisonné, but I'm trying to, you know use the best pieces I have to compare with older pieces of cloisonné. So something like this with um, with just a bunch of cloisons all around it, that would also be somewhat more similar to an antique piece of Chinese cloisonné. Not necessarily um, background cloisons throughout the whole piece, more like the design allows it to have the diapers or background cloisons, partitions, however you will. And in this one, you can see the wires pretty well. So yeah, um, sometimes, sometimes the older Chinese cloisonné will bear some resemblance to this, just because, like I said, they're not using background cloisons to uh, <clears throat> to support everything. They're using the design of the piece to do that. So you'll see here again, we've got the mushroom um, border and uh, at the top too. And then still throughout this piece, even though it kind of has a representation of an open background, you'll note that there's still cloisons going through these enamel layers. And it's just because, um, you know, I think, uh, I think the Chinese haven't, still haven't perfected the technique of making like big open borders. So, you know, there's all this green over here and that's actually sort of a wireless technique there. Uh, you can see there's no wire that separates this tree from... <laughs> I'm sorry, my dog talks. I don't know if you heard him or not. You can see there's no cloisonne or cloison that separates this tree from the water in the background. Or sky, whichever it may be. I think sky, because these look like mountains, don't they? So, um... So, yeah, uh, you'll notice again, there's a bunch of cloisons in the background and that helps keep everything in place. I, I believe, especially as they fire it. So, yeah, um, let's just keep talking about this. Over here, you can see uh, very typical cloud shapes. I mean, these are the cloisons. Oh, stupid goose again. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to move that thing again. He's very front heavy. Okay, I'm going to set him over there because it's not even that important that we talk about him. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of different cloud patterns here.
and these are uh, 20th century. You'll note that this one is slightly different. It almost looks like a paw more than it looks like a cloud. So, I mean, you'll find different ones, and different ones can be from different times. Um, these are all definitely 20th century pieces. Um, I would even say late 20th century pieces, 1950s and up. So, uh, so yeah, that's just where you are on that. Um, this little guy is actually pretty neat. I like, I enjoy this turtle quite a bit. He's got little scale cloisons. He's got a little, I assume, Buddhist symbol or something like that. He's got little uh, cloisons to denote his scaly shell and stuff. And on the bottom, he's actually got neat little cloisons too. So yeah, uh, Chinese, Chinese cloisonne is animals a uh, fair bit of the time. I've seen a lot, a lot of different animals. Um, they definitely liked making birds. Uh, and again, you know, I wish uh, I wish we had some older pieces of Chinese cloisonne. If anyone ever wants to donate some older pieces of Chinese cloisonne to my channel, <laughs> I hear by the Oh my goodness! It's okay. It's okay. We only tipped over the Chinese birds. Um, these aren't worth that much. Uh, my camera's very oddly proportioned on this stand, so that's that's my fault. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again with the Japanese stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, the comparison is that I've gotten I've gotten the um, Chinese clothes that I have mostly at garage sales and stuff for quarters, you know, dollars. Um, and it's not worth an incredible amount. I mean, these pieces are worth something. They're they're of value. It's just not um, anything that's going to change your life until you get to the older pieces, and then you can really start to see some dividends. Um, so yeah, uh, Chinese cloisonne a lot more common to have animals from Chinese cloisonne. So if you see a Chinese or if you see a bird that's cloisonne, it's probably Chinese, almost a guarantee. Um, so then we've got this big. Uh, this is my biggest piece of Chinese clay. In fact, this is, I think, the biggest thing I own um, as far as vases or anything like that. But again, you'll see that all throughout the background of this piece, even though it's large, uh, they've had to um, support the enamel for the background by putting just a ton of designs and stuff all over it. It's very busy, you know what I mean? It's... um. It's got something going on, and that's pretty much the rule for Chinese cloisonne. It'll have something going on in the background at, at all segments. So, so that's that. And then we'll come to an early Japanese piece. Um, I don't think this would have been like one of the first pieces or anything, but this is an early piece, and there are still Chinese themes, I would say. Even though I've never seen specifically this um, style of border, I, I've I've never seen this style of border, uh, Chinese, Japanese, anywhere. So if anyone wants to show me more of this style of piece, I'd be happy to see it. But um, we can tell because of the uh, the um, less polished enamel. First off. Um, the background cloisons, uh, not background cloisons, um, the shading, the enamel shading, and these flower colors are very common to Japanese enamel. Kind of a light pink that fades into white, and uh, really just everything about this looks Japanese to me. And if we were to turn it around, um, which we'll very carefully, very carefully just pick it up and let you see briefly the back of the plate, chargers, uh, plates, um, bowls, stuff like that. If they're Japanese, sometimes they'll have this swirl pattern. Sometimes they'll have a scale pattern. Um, but this is almost definitely going to be a Japanese plate if you turn it around. <clears throat> and uh, that dates it to pretty much the Meiji era um, and likely early Meiji era. Which everything about that piece denotes an earlier piece of Meiji era cloisonne. Um, they hadn't perfected open backgrounds yet, I don't think, because you can see that this also is kind of busy, although in a much more naturalized style. <laughs> so then, um, you know, 
uh, Japan actually led the what is known as the golden era of cloisonne. So they figured out how to make open backgrounds with enamel. Um, before then, you know, there had to be some sort of support for the enamel. Otherwise, it would just run off during the firing process or, you know, leak into other sections. I, I'm not exactly sure what happens that, um... <laughs> that was my dog. Um, I'm not exactly sure what happens. I'm just speculating as a person that kind of understands, like, science and pastes and liquids and what happens when things are heated up. So, so I imagine what happens, um when you don't use a background cloison is that it just runs all over the place and doesn't stay where you wanted it to be. So at some point in time, Japan um, did a bunch of research and they figured out how to make large open portions of cloisonne. So you can see that this uh, Eagle Charger, um, while he is pretty heavily cloisoned, I mean, he's got feathers and you know all sorts of stuff all over the place. But there's a giant light blue open background. And before Japan got a hold of Cloisonne, that was impossible. So large open backgrounds are in a pretty definite sign that the piece is Japanese and likely even Meiji era. Although they do make um, just kind of plainish uh, wireless Cloisonne in Japan these days. Like even now, Ando Cloisonne is alive and well which is delightful. Um, so then we'll move on to, um, let's see, just make sure I kind of talked about borders. You'll notice that this, uh, this mushroom border is just slightly different than the others, but it's still kind of in that same vein. And I forgot to mention that while we were still talking about the Chinese pieces. And then in the bottom, that's quite a bit different than, um, than most of the other mushroom borders and stuff. But yeah, that's more common of uh, like Chinese cloisonne backgrounds. So yeah, um, let's see here. We've got this little fella. Now this is a this is a pretty different thing. I believe he's got copper flakes in his background, and that's called goldstone technique. But you'll also notice that there's certain portions of this that are kind of open. So uh. Japan, during the golden age of cloisonne, also invented black enamel. And I believe that after they opened up their borders, because uh, they were a closed off nation for hundreds of years, they didn't trade with anyone, uh, a little bit with the Dutch. And, uh, and yeah, they just uh, they didn't really talk to the rest of the world about science or, or anything like that. So then... Um, during the uh, Meiji era, they opened up trade and they started talking to other people. And I believe what happened is they, some company, um, it may have been an artist or a studio. Um, I'm fairly certain that one of the, um, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't tell you exactly who it was, but I think somebody hired a German scientist or a German chemist and he came to Japan and helped them figure out a formula for black enamel. So Japan was the, uh, I believe, the first place to have black enamel. And you can see that this one doesn't have a clear coat or anything. It's just a slightly polished um, black enamel. And you can see again that there's large open spaces. I mean, larger than you find typically on any Chinese piece. And this thing's only, you know, four inches tall or so. Well, I think it's about five inches tall, but still. You can see that's quite a bit different of a uh, border or fence. And if you see irises like this, uh, especially with the intricate wire work inside of them, that's almost always Japanese. I don't think I've ever seen a uh, Chinese piece that represented the flowers that way. And obviously we've got a few um, black pieces because I wanted to highlight that a bit since it was a Japanese invention. Um, so yeah. Uh, 
And you can see the, almost the entire back of this one is a beautiful black, uh, just empty background. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, looking at those two black ones, then you see that this is an earlier Meiji era piece than those two, I think. And um, you can see that the black enamel is already in effect. And the goldstone technique has been used in the background. You can see the little shinies as it spins. Now, I think a lot of the time this was copper or, um, uh, I forget the name of the stone, but, uh, but what, what they would do is lay the stones in the black enamel and then sand away at it until some of that copper shone through. And that was known as the goldstone technique. And, um, and sometimes I believe that the, uh, a layer of enamel would contain actual flakes of gold or gold leaf. And, uh, I think those are two just slightly varying techniques on how to get kind of shinies like that. You'll see um, again right here we've got uh, these these beautiful irises with the uh, intricate wire work and obviously that's again Japanese but if we turn it then we see there's a large open background again. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah. Now this, this is a bit different. This is a piece of Jinbari cloisonne, which I think is strictly uh, Japanese. I believe what they've done, uh, there's a couple of different uh, slightly varying techniques, and I think pretty much just everyone refers to both of them as Jinbari. But either they can... <clears throat> Um, give the vase underneath this texture so like this vase might actually have all that texture or it might just be the foil that has that texture but um, I'm not sure what that other techniques called where it's the vase that would have the texture as opposed to the uh, foil but either way what you would end up with is a shiny background on a uh, cloisonne vase and sometimes it'll have wired cloisonne and sometimes it won't but uh, this technique, I believe everyone would just agree, is called Jinbari Cloisonne. Or sometimes Jimbari Cloisonne. It's G-I-N-B-A-R-I, -I, as far as I've learned to spell it. But yeah, um, if it's shiny foil in the background, that's pretty much exclusively Japanese as well. <clears throat> and then we've got uh, this other example of Jinbari Cloisonne which they've just cut little squares of the foil and put them in the background and then covered that with enamel. Now this one obviously also has wired cloisonne or Yusen Jippo uh, in, in front of or you know overlapping. And these could be called roundels or even mons. And then you see this slightly different border here. Uh, the little circles the little circles are why I picked this because that's very common to uh, to Japanese cloisonne, the small circle border. So yeah, this is Austin. Um, you know, hopefully, just introducing you to some different stylizing, <laughs> stylizing and techniques. Um, you know, I hope this is a pretty fair representation. Oh, I did mean to show you this uh, this somewhat larger red vase. Um, this is called Oxblood. I think uh, I think Japan was pretty well responsible for this too. You'll see there's a slightly differing border up there. Now I've seen somewhat similar borders to that on Chinese pieces. So now, this piece does have some damage, but but I loved it a lot and I got it anyway. And these are both pretty cheap. I have a pair of these and they were thirty and forty dollars, I believe. But yeah. Um, you can see the... Oh! Okay. <laughs> Accidents abound. You can see the cloisons there, but but more importantly, I had picked this out because of the giant red um, empty background, which is pretty impressive and would have been extraordinarily difficult uh, originally. So. so it's worth noting that, again, big open backgrounds, that's, that's pretty well going to be Japanese. So yeah, this is Austin, the best thing in a 40 Antiques channel, hopefully educating you a little bit, um, 
you know, it's a shame we don't have slightly better pieces to uh, show you on the Chinese side, because really some Chinese cloisonne is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, but yeah, this is Austin of the Best I Can Afford Antiques channel, and I hope you'll like, share, comment, subscribe, do whatever you want. You know, I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy some of these. I've got like, I think I really have like 200 videos now, so I mean, if you'd like to learn more about any of these particular pieces, you know, if you'd like to, if you'd like to just stare at something pretty for a while, or if you just want to listen to me talk while you're on your phone, uh, you know, do what you want. This is awesome.